Hello everyone, Dr. Dan here. Welcome back to the program. We've got a really exciting episode for you today. We're going to talk a little bit more of a deeper dive into a particular paper or actually kind of a set of papers and look at an evolving area of obesity medicine. Now before I forget, make sure you hit that button down below to subscribe so you always will get the updates when the new videos come out. Right now we're releasing them every other week, but we're gonna be increasing that soon, so you wanna make sure you're on top of that. So the science in obesity medicine is still very much in its infancy compared to say other chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension, and that's largely due to the fact that obesity actually wasn't even declared a chronic disease until about 2015 by both the Canadian Medical Association and the American Medical Association. And there's still a lot of associations and medical groups and even governments across the globe that don't actually recognize obesity as a chronic disease. So this has been a major barrier to getting more science done. However, now that we have this recognition, this understanding, what this really opens up the doors to is not only more funding and more research, but also more people looking at it and saying, hey, we need to, we need to do something about this. We know there's something going on. We've got this pathological process. Well, let's start diving into it deeper and get a better understanding of what we're dealing with. And this is all great in one sense, but at the same time, for those individuals that have been living with obesity up to this point, this has been a long time coming and we really still have a long ways to go. Now, for me, who has the entrepreneurial spirit, tends not to be a very big fan of rules, possibly some high functioning ADHD. And as my mother likes to put it, he tends to believe that his way is the right way. This infancy in, in obesity medicine really is, well, it's perfect for me because it really opens up the door for innovation, out of the box thinking and living in the gray area, which is where I excel. Now, I feel like a lot of clinicians in this space, we're all kind of swinging to the fences. Like we have some preliminary data, some preliminary information, but at the same time, there's a lot of different models and methods and practices that are currently ongoing, that are currently under development, including my own, and I think all of us as clinicians are really trying to piece together what is the best modalities and treatments for our patients. And so we're really kind of playing around in the fog, essentially, trying to figure out what's the best based on what science we currently have, and then also waiting for the more future science to come out. And that is exactly what I've been observing in terms of today's topic. So let's jump into it, because I'm really excited to tell you about it. So one area in particular that I've been watching evolve and change in the science, kind of giving us some mixed information over the last couple of years, has been the area around metabolic adaptation or adaptive thermogenesis. Now, I want to talk about one or two studies today in a little bit more detail because they've had a lot of influence in this space and they've been kind of a cornerstone up until recently where now the data is suddenly starting to morph and change a little bit and possibly going in a different direction. But first, what exactly is metabolic adaptation and adaptive thermogenesis? As an individual loses weight, we see a slowing of their resting metabolic rate or their RMR. Some people might refer to it as BMR or basal metabolic rate. There's slight differences, but just so you're aware. So RMR is how many calories an individual burns on a day-to-day -day basis just by existing. Doing nothing, not moving around, if you were in a coma and doing nothing but breathing and your digestive tract doing its thing and your heart beating, that's how many calories you would burn is your resting metabolic rate, so just at rest. And when an individual loses weight in the phenomena of metabolic adaptation, what we see is a reduction or a further reduction in RMR greater than what would be expected based on the body's composition changes. And for an English translation, let's say an individual goes from 200 pounds down to 140 pounds. Their RMR will actually be lower than an individual that weighs 140 pounds but didn't lose weight to get there. So there's that gap between what it should be for a 140 pound individual and where the individual that has lost the weight is. So their resting metabolic rate is actually lower, so they're burning fewer calories on a day-to-day -day basis compared to someone that is of the same weight but didn't lose weight. And metabolic adaptation is thought to occur in order to counter your weight loss efforts. You see, your body is a, well, really, it's a stage five clinger and it's needy and really what it's trying to do is trying to hold on to as much energy as it possibly can, just in case the zombie apocalypse comes. Which, based on the way 2020 went, I would not be surprised in the slightest if that did occur in 2021 and turns out the vaccine was bad or something, which it actually isn't, please get vaccinated for COVID. One of the major problems with metabolic adaptation is that it seems that it may persist for a number of years afterwards as well, even after an individual has gained the weight back and then some. So Kevin Hall and his friends published a study back 
back in 2012 that looked at the individuals that participated in the Biggest Loser TV reality show. Do you remember that one? Basically, all the individuals were put on these ridiculously low calorie diets, were told to exercise like six hours a day, screamed at by all these jacked personal trainers, all in an effort to try and lose as much weight as possible so they could win some money and get the prestige of being the biggest loser. But I will not bore you with my soapbox today about how stupid I thought that show was and also how ridiculous reality TV is in general. Sorry to all the people that like the biggest shore or Jersey shore or something like that. So Kevin Hall and his friends in 2012 demonstrated that the 16 competitors from the biggest loser competition who lost a large amount of weight developed metabolic adaptation after the competition. And they wanted to know if six years later, if that metabolic adaptation persisted and was it correlated with weight regain? And in a follow-up study, six years later, they looked at 14 out of the 16 biggest loser competition competitors and they absolutely confirmed their hypothesis that metabolic adaptation persisted for up to six years after the competition and all that weight loss. So in order to figure this all out, they actually got the individuals to come to a study site and they did all kinds of fancy and special tests in order to measure their resting metabolic rate, their total daily energy expenditure, as well as their physical activity energy expenditure as well. Then they did some math things and, you know, I did fail first year calculus in case you missed that in previous videos and voila, they came up with their data set. So originally, after the Biggest Loser competition, what they found is that a majority of the individuals lost approximately 58.3 so kilos, plus or minus like 25 kilos or something like that. And after six years, nearly every single one of the competitors had gained nearly all of the weight back. And there's actually five of the subjects that were within 1% of their baseline weight before they even started the Biggest Loser competition. And interestingly, there's actually one of the competitors that didn't regain any of the weight back. And just to clarify, over the course of the competition and six years later, the changes in weight that they were seeing, about 80% of it was due to fat mass, either increasing or decreasing. And obviously that other 20% would be other tissues such as muscle and such like that. So what did they find in terms of the rest metabolic rate of these individuals? Well, they all started at about 2,600 calories, obviously plus or minus some amount. And then at the end of the competition, they actually found that their resting metabolic rate decreased to about 1,900 calories or 1,990, I believe. And then six years later, after a significant amount of weight regain, their RMR was actually slightly, slightly lower, but still way down and very similar to what it was post-competition at about 1,900 calories per day. Now, this is pretty mind-blowing because six years later, we're still seeing these reduced resting metabolic rates despite all of these individuals pretty much gaining the weight back. In fact, five of them are within 1%. And so their RMR at post-competition and six years later was essentially the same. It didn't really change. And what's worse is the individuals that lost the most weight had the greatest and most sustained resting metabolic rate changes. And so to give you a little summary, essentially the resting metabolic rate of these individuals six years later was approximately 500 calories less than what we expected based on their body composition and their age. So really talk about your body giving you the big middle finger and telling you F you for trying to lose weight. And no wonder these individuals gained the weight back. Essentially their body was fighting them so hard and then any weight that they did regain, they would need to be in such a massive calorie deficit to essentially overcome and actually burn more calories, which probably in turn, if they lost weight again and managed to get themselves in that calorie deficit consistently, they probably would have even further metabolic adaptation of some kind potentially. So clearly sometimes the human body is a bit of an asshole. So I know what you're probably asking right now is, okay, the body doesn't want to lose weight. It's going to fight us on that. And number two, even if we do try to lose weight or are successful in losing weight, our body is basically screwed right out the gate. It's not ever going to recover, at least for six years. So what the F? So as I've discussed previously, losing weight is actually an evolutionary disadvantage. What essentially the body is doing is that 30,000 years ago when food was scarce, if we were losing weight, that was a bad thing. If we lost too much weight, well, that would mean death. Now, over the last 30,000 years, the human species as a whole has done a lot of cool things. We've adapted to a number of things. We've created languages, math, more complex and emotional problems that we have to deal with and et cetera, et cetera. But one thing we haven't done very well or even at all is we haven't evolved and adapted to our more 
obesogenic environment that we've essentially created. So yes, your body is constantly adapting. It is fully aware of if you're losing weight or not, and it's probably going to make your weight loss journey that much more challenging. Actually, not probably. I know it's going to make it that much more challenging. But does that truly mean that your metabolism is going to be screwed for the rest of your life? And really, not necessarily. As I said before, there is some new research coming out that's showing that might not be the case. And now you're probably wondering, well, what is the case? Tell us all about it, Dr. Dan. And I'm going to totally be that guy that's going to say this is part one. You're going to have to stay tuned for part two. So that's going to mean either subscribing down below, joining my email list, and that way you can be up to date on all the episodes as well as all the podcasts and what we're up to at Healthcare Evolution. So stay tuned, everybody. And if you liked the video, give us a like, leave us a comment if you have a question, or shoot me an email. I want to hear from you guys, all right? Don't forget to subscribe, and we will chat with you later.